All right. Welcome, my friend, once again to the next episode in the Red Delta Project podcast slash live Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel. This is every Wednesday evening when I can get to it, when I can get off work and stuff. Although I am toying with the idea of maybe doing this Wednesday afternoons here in Mountain Time here in Denver, just because I'm wondering if that might work best for you to get in on the call. And that way you can ask questions. I want to make this live q a as accessible to everyone as possible so if the afternoon or earlier in the day works better for you please leave it down below in the comment section to let me know and also uh, as always please do check out the full selection of books on the red delta project.com uh, or on amazon links are down below in the description as well as a reminder that that's how i support this podcast is the sale of the books that i've written i've written seven books now at this point book number eight is in the works number nine is in the uh, outline stage, so check them out down below and uh, so on. So, all right, enough with that sort of thing. Last week, I talked about the unbelievable high importance of establishing your beliefs because even though like we get lost in the minutia of things like what's your diet, what's your workout program, sets, reps, you know, what kind of weight are you using? All that stuff is important, but it's superficial. It's the stuff on the surface, the deep seated emotional beliefs that you are holding. And yes, beliefs are based on how we feel about things. It's kind of a little misnomer that our beliefs are formed on things like facts and information and knowledge, but you can't learn your way out of a belief or into a new belief just by like coming across data as it were. If that were the case, then any belief debate that we've had about religion and politics could easily be resolved with, well, there are these facts and people look at the facts and go, hmm, yes, okay, I see how my opinion was wrong on that. Never happens. When you want to make someone's beliefs change, you hit them in the heart, not the mind. Advertisers have known this for generations, right? Over in Europe, the classic example that uh, marketing uh, and advertisers give is why can't they sell jewelry and diamonds in Europe like they do here in the United States? It's because or at least it used to be the case where when you had advertisements for diamonds and stuff, it was like, look at these carrots and these are the, the clarity and the cut and this is the value of this. No one cared. No one cared about numbers. No one cared about that stuff. But here in the United States, they don't even mention the damn rock. It would come Christmas time in the holidays. It shows this beautiful woman getting, you know, a diamond necklace or a bracelet. And she's like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. And Guys are lining up outside the jewelry store going like, I want my wife to feel that way. Our beliefs are based on how we feel. It's an emotional thing. So today's topic, I'm covering some of the biggest beliefs that I find people run right into when it comes to losing weight, building muscle that stops them in their tracks before they even pick up a dumbbell or start changing their diet around. So let's jump right in. The first belief that really limits folks is this is one that I've come across a lot where people say, I'm not that kind of person. You know, I get that all the time. See, I'll tell someone like, okay, try 10 push-ups a day, or let's have some vegetables with dinner. Just the smallest, almost seemingly insignificant pieces of advice. And immediately they're like, back, back, evil demon. I don't want your, like, I'm not that kind of person. They say it time and time again. And oftentimes that's because what they associate those habits with is a certain type of an individual, certain character traits that they're, if they do that, they'll start to become more of a certain type of uh, character set associated with that, like the dumb, stupid bodybuilder, right? I mean, the, they play up on this, especially in like the Planet Fitness ads. You ever want to see some of these fears realized? Look at the old Planet Fitness ads, right? They've got that bodybuilder who walks in and the uh, Guy's giving him the tour, like, what do you want? And the bodybuilder is like this stupid, real egotistical, like, I, I picked the weights up and I put them down. And he keeps asking questions, gives the same, I picked them up, put them down. Giving this idea that if you have strength and muscle, you're this stupid, brainless jock. I mean, actually, in my world, I find that's the opposite. You find the biggest guy in the gym, chances are they're also some of the smartest people in the gym, very deep philosophical uh, discussions and stuff around the bench press. Not always, of course, I'm generalizing, but I'm making the point that if we associate certain behaviors with certain character traits and we believe those are negative things, like 
being stupid, being brainless, being narcissistic, being selfish, being shallow. If we associate these things with the goal and objective that we actually secretly want, then we're self-sabotaging at every turn. You're not gonna let yourself do that because that's what your self-conscious does, is it protects you from things you don't want, even on a deep subconscious level. So that's why a lot of times when people are trying to get in shape and they can't seem to get any traction, it's because some belief in their heart is saying, don't do that, that you're gonna become the wrong kind of person. And make no mistake about it, any sort of big changes that you're going to make in your health and fitness is going to result or come from some sort of a personal change. You cannot stay the same person you are now and make big changes in the results that you're getting. There's just no way you turn into a different type of person, but that's not a bad thing. In fact, a lot of times when people are up on stage giving lectures at seminars and stuff, they'll often say, I built muscle, I lost weight, I made money, whatever it is. But the real value was the better person I became as I accomplished those objectives. And they didn't go down a negative path, they became better off for it. They, be, they did change as a person, but they turned into a better version of themselves. So when people are like, I'm not that kind of person, I'm like, I know you're not that kind of person, but you're also not gonna be able to stay the same kind of person you are now. And that's the other belief that holds people back sometimes is they'll say, I'm not that kind of person, but I'm this kind of person. I'm the person who does this. I do this. I don't think that I'm not the kind of person to do X, Y, and Z. And what that does is it really pigeonholes them into essentially they're subconsciously telling themselves, stay the way you are. Warts and all, right? And you hold the, these things back. I mean, this stuff comes up a lot, used to come up a lot in martial arts, right? Where uh, we would talk about uh, kick higher, kick faster, go to more classes, uh, sort of thing. And one of the reactions that students sometimes would have would be something like, I can't because, I can't do it because of this. What they're really saying is, I'm not that kind of person, or I'm this type of person who doesn't do that sort of thing. My instructor always had the best comeback for that. He's like, always fight for the limitations you want to keep, which of course short circuits the mind. And it's like, well, why would I want to fight for a limitation? It's like, well, I don't know, but that's exactly what you're doing. When I say things like try doing a few push-ups a day and add some vegetables or protein to each meal, and people are like, oh, I can't do that because of X, Y, and Z, or I'm not that kind of person and stuff, they are fighting for that limitation. They are fighting to stay where they are. They're either afraid of what might happen or they're afraid of leaving their current situation. It's an emotional thing. It has nothing to do with knowledge. It has almost nothing to do with, I need to learn something, right? I need to understand the right information. Nothing you learn is going to change how you feel. Feeling differently comes from a different level of understanding of that thing. Like you think, oh, I'm not the kind of person who would go to a gym. I'm not the kind of person who would work out. These are beliefs that I used to hold myself. I wouldn't be caught dead in a gym. I would go, you'd have to drag me kicking and screaming to go to a workout. I would never do that sort of thing because I'm not that kind of person, right? But over time, I started to do little habits that kind of work me up to them. Before I know it, I'm like begging on my hands and knees at the local gym that just opened up. I was like, please let me join here, right? Because how I felt about it changed. My beliefs changed about what it meant to work out in a gym. So are you afraid of becoming something else? And I'm saying, don't be afraid because you're not gonna become something you don't wanna be. You're not gonna become narcissistic jerk. You're not gonna become stuck up, snotty, shallow individual. You're gonna be a better version of whatever you are. You're gonna be a better you, right? Or are you afraid of leaving the kind of person that you feel you are now? And watch your language on this. Watch what people say. It's like, I'm a hard gainer. Oh, I'm always tight. I'm always stiff. I have bad joints. All these things, they're reaffirming these sorts of things. The reinforming, I'm this kind of person. I'm not that kind of person. You are programming your subconscious beliefs to stay where you are. And nothing you do as far as trying to get in better shape is gonna get you very far until you switch and work on those beliefs. So just watch your language a little bit. Another thing that you can do is start to watch just 
what are the, some of your natural habits? One of the big red flags that people often run into is, are you oftentimes having trouble getting traction with consistent habits or putting things off? Now I've had some clients that I've worked out for with for years and they've maybe missed two workouts in like six years, two workouts. I had one client and we always joke about it because she's like, yeah, the one time I missed a workout, I was literally getting wheeled into the emergency room. And as she was getting wheeled in the emergency room, she's on the phone talking to me going, sorry, I won't make my session. That's a person who has a very deep seated belief to need to work out, who wants to work out. Her identity and her personal belief structure of how she feels about working out is very positive. But I've also had some people where it seems like life just always gets in the way where they would book like eight sessions in the month and they might come to two of them. And every single time at the last minute, oh, my meeting ran long. Oh, my car won't start. Oh, I've got a sore wrist. Oh, this, oh, that. When we keep running into things like that, what it really is, and I know life sometimes happens, of course, but when it's consistent, it's a red flag that you really don't want to do that. There's some feeling inside that's holding you back. Case in point, this past weekend, right? This exact same thing happened to me. I am lucky, one of the lucky ones to get an advanced copy of Dragon Door's new ISO chain. I did an unboxing here on the RDP YouTube channel and stuff like that. Great uh, machine looking forward and I unboxed it and I got it on Friday. It took me until Sunday afternoon to finally use it. And I had it in my home and everything like that, but it was like every time I'd pick up the manual, read a sentence like, oh, I gotta do dishes read a couple of sentences an hour later, oh no, I should go and do grocery shopping. I was always putting it off. And I could have told myself, oh no, I'm so busy. I just haven't gotten a chance to it. But the reality was I was afraid to use it. I was afraid to give Dragon Doors ISO Chain a try because I was terrified that I wasn't going to like it. Because when I was reading all the materials and stuff, the dominant feeling I had about the thing was that this thing is gonna be junk. This thing is a crapshoot. This is a gimmick. This is, I invested in it because I wanted to support John Duquesne and Dragon Door and Paul Wade and stuff. That's the only reason why I did it. I didn't think there was any real value to it at all. But now that I've used it, I can't wait to use it again because it's incredible. I'll be doing a review here and stuff, but it was entirely how I felt about it. It wasn't anything because dishes can wait. Who cares about the dishes, right? But the whole reason why it took me 48 hours to finally hook it up and give it a try was because I was afraid to use it. And because I was afraid, I kept putting it off. So when our emotional state comes through in our actions, and we often blame our external circumstances, like I just don't have time, I don't have the money, I don't have this, don't have that and stuff. But the reality is, if the desire is there, you will find a way. If someone has the emotional alignment to build muscle, you could throw them in a gym with nothing but shake weights, thigh masters, and Tony Little Gazelles with a McDonald's for the smoothie bar, and they'll find a way to make it happen. But if you don't have that and you're like me and you're like, oh, I'm afraid of kind of doing this and you've got some emotional friction, you put them at the Olympic Training Center and it's still not going to get very far. So watch your speech. Watch your behaviors. Does it feel like life is always getting in the way? What are you afraid of? And I'm not saying that judgmental or anything because we all do this. We all do it from time to time where we're afraid to move forward or we're afraid to leave our current situation. And these questions I'm asking you, just ruminate it in the back of your mind. Observe these things because that's how we change belief is we question them. If you attack your beliefs, you're going to go right back to where you are. Again, think of a debate you've had in like a cocktail party or something where people are debating theological or religious or political things, right? An attack on a belief is felt emotionally. If I have a belief of like, you know, Ford is the best car in the world and someone says Ford sucks, that feels on an emotional level exactly the same as if someone points at me and says, you're an asshole and you're an idiot. It's exactly the same. Attack someone's beliefs, you're attacking them. And that's why it doesn't make sense and it's not productive to attack a belief even if you hold it and you know it's holding you back. Don't attack your beliefs. Work with them. Question them. Just be like, yeah, but is that really the case? Is that always? Is, is that always the case or are there exceptions to that? And that bridges the door open just a little bit. You can kind of get a toe in the door and you're like, 
well, you know, maybe I can build muscle. Like it can't be impossible, right? And okay, so losing weight is hard, but is it really impossible? Am I really impossible to lose weight? Well, no. And all you got to do is just get a little wiggle room in there and then you can start to shimmy it out and build up a whole new belief system. And once you start doing that, you're off and lean to the races. Let's see, I wrote them down here. Um, other beliefs, um, uh, things like I don't have the resources. Sometimes this will come up where I'll have uh, like videos where I'm shooting, where I'm using suspension straps from NOSC, or my isoloop or something. And people are like, I can't do that. I don't have the equipment. My re knee jerk response is usually, so get it. Like, just get the equipment. Like, NOSC is some of the most affordable trainers in the world. Here's a video. Make your own. All you need is a couple pieces of rope, right? It'll cost you five bucks kind of thing. And that's kind of, an, again, a reflective of a, of a belief system of if you have that belief of I'm going to make this happen and I can make it happen, you'll find a way. <laughs> you'll lift bales of hay. You'll lift rocks. You'll find a way. But if someone is like, okay, here I am using this thing. Oh, I can't do that. I don't have the time and stuff. You're immediately choom, shutting it down and saying, can't do it because there's something inside. You know, you, I don't have time. Yeah, I know nobody has time these days. Nobody has money. Nobody has energy. But what's that got to do with actually getting in shape? Because if you want enough, if you, if that emotional alignment is there, you will find somehow to make it happen. But if it's not, you'll be shut down by a hangnail. You're like, oh, I can't work out today. There's no way, you know, it's, it's the vernal equinox. There's no way I can get to the gym today. That's the thing to look out for. How easy are you to stop? How easy it is to, to, uh, to hold yourself back? One more belief that I wanna cover real quick, then I'll get to your questions, which is you have to suffer for your results. And this is a belief I'm addressing because I used to believe it for years myself that the more you suffer, the more effort it takes the better results are. And there's a correlation, yes, between hard work and results, but it's a correlation, not a causation. I used to purposely make myself suffer as much as possible in my diet and exercise habits because I believed it would always pay off, but that's not the case. If anything, now I've gone 180 degrees and my attitude now is how can I make this as easy as possible? How can I get a productive result with as little effort as I can manage? And it's nothing to do with being lazy. It's about being intelligent about what you're doing because you can't work hard enough to get results if you're inefficient at what you're doing. If you don't work smarter, you'll never be able to work hard enough. So that's one of the beliefs that I've recently started to reverse. And it, again, it took me like three, four years to finally get to this point where I can recommend this sort of idea on a podcast because I used to have that belief of, your value is in your suffering. Your value is in your whole work. Your value as a human being depends on how hard you can make yourself work. If you're lazy, you're worthless as a human being. That's the belief system I used to hold. That's what I used to have so deep within. I didn't even know I had it. But the thing is, it held me back so much. And everybody like would scratch my family, you know, friends, and they'd be scratching. They're like, you know, the hardest working people I know you work more hours, you're put pushing yourself to the point where you're always like getting sick and exhausted, yet you're always struggling to get anywhere. How the hell is that possible? And finally, eventually it's like, cause you can't outwork laziness. I was so lazy. I was just trying to get results through hard work alone. I wasn't trying to actually learn to do anything better. So it's a belief that takes time. Beliefs take time to work on, but I wanted to just give you this information now so you can look for some of those red flags i mentioned maybe get a little bit of some wiggle room in them and then the real changes can start to happen okay i went a little long-winded on that i apologize but let's get to some of these questions uh questions down below we're talking calisthenics we're talking weight loss we're talking programming anything that you would like to do nicholas how would you go about gaining your strength back from nerve damage oh good good question that's a real tough one because your nervous system is what drives your muscles. And to be perfectly honest, Nicholas, I have no idea. That's like saying there's no wires to the light socket. How do I get the light to turn on? It's a, it's a tough one. A good question for a physical therapist. That is where the EMS 
Uh, therapy may play a good role. EMS, electronic muscle stimulation, which is basically a prosthetic nervous system. It's a little computer. You put a pad on your muscle, has a wire running to it. It's basically does exactly the same thing as your nervous system, but it's external rather than internal, right? So that's a good application for that because if your nervous system has some sort of damage to it, you can use that EMS uh, prosthetically to stimulate the muscle growth. And that can potentially, I'm guessing here, I, I'm not an expert in this, but can potentially help the nerves heal, regenerate. I don't know how we would heal nerves though. That would be more for a doctor or physical therapist to answer there. But if there's a way to heal it, if there's a way to get it better, that's what I do. But in the meantime, I would go with something like EMS therapy uh, and or I don't know if isometrics would help or not because isometrics is a neurological conditioning thing, but I don't know if the type of damage you would have would respond to that or not. But uh, awesome questions, because yeah, if you have some nerve, nerve issues, it's going to be an uphill battle. Um, it's very, very hard to get any sort of stimulus to the muscles with damaged nerves. All right, let's see, more questions. <laughs> Bobby, just comment real quick. Dude is like a Zen master of physical training, right to the soul of this stuff. <laughs> Absolutely. You got to have soul when you're training. But again, like I was kind of referring to earlier on, you talk to the biggest guys in the gym, the ones who have the best results, and you're going to find there's a deep river running through that individual's heart and soul. Really deep. One good example on Instagram, social media, check out Kai Green. Right? He's runner up for Mr. Universe, like unknown how many times he's always doing neck and neck battles with Phil Heath, or at least he was back in the day. That's a deep individual because you don't make great things happen without deep waters. Uh, silent rivers run deep as it were. So it's uh, there's a lot of deep stuff. And the deeper you go, the better it can uh, be. Uh, let's see what more questions. Lots of comments, folks. Love the comments you guys are bringing, bringing on. Uh, very good stuff. Uh, yeah, a small drip will fill a large bucket over time. Michael's chiming in. Absolutely. And that's really the only way we can never really make a good amount of progress. I always use the analogy of building a wall. Getting results is like building up a big wall. And walls are made up of bricks. You look at any single brick, it looks small and insignificant. That's not going to defend a castle. It's not going to ward off an army, right? But you stack them time and time and time again. And that's why we always want to be looking at what habits are the easier to maintain because the easier habits to maintain are the ones that are going to stand the better chance of helping you build up over time. The big hard habits, the hard to maintain stuff. Yeah. They may be better off in the short term. Yeah. They may be big boulders that you can put in the, in the wall, but if you can only stack three or four of them before you quit, it's not going to build up to very much. So that's one of the reasons why my belief changed into the perspective of easier is better. Because when you really actually look at the whole of human history, nothing great or no advancement was ever accomplished without making things easier. Using the path of least resistance, any kind of advancement, any kind of productivity, any time that you're like, well, this used to be hard to happen or it couldn't be possible, then this person invented this system or this method or this gadget or whatever. And now we could do that with less effort. It's easier to do it. And suddenly, boom, people are illiterate. Boom, medicine all over the place. Boom, we're warding off smallpox. Everything happens because it gets easier. So these are some of the ways I've come to that belief. Trust me, life is going to be plenty hard. You don't need to make it harder on you. No one gets a free ride in life. No one's going to have it easy. It's always going to be hard. It's always going to be challenging for everyone, no matter what. So why not at least find your shortcuts? Why not at least make it easier? Because when you make things easier, you either A, make it easier to maintain what you've got so you keep your results, or B, you open the door for greater advancements so the same amount of effort produces better results. All right. Oh, hard one here. Bolt thrower. I suffer from insomnia. Man, insomnia is a tough one. I knew a guy by the name of Nick who was an unbelievable badass. 
Uh, I mean, he literally had a job of working in state penitentiaries, and he was the guy you called in when the the heat was going down. When there was a fight, you called Nick, and Nick, Nick came in, and he busted heads and got people to uh, go in line and stuff. Unbelievable badass. He suffered from it as well. That's a hard one. That's like nerve damage. There's no getting around that one. There's no good coming from it. There's no workaround. It's something that needs to be helped. There's always sleep clinics. There's always just getting into a sleep habit. You know, sleep is just like diet and exercise. It's about habits. It's about trying to get to bed each night, same time. It's about not uh, staring at your phone for an hour beforehand, reading a book, taking a shower, having a bit of a nightly ritual. And if nothing else, getting your exercise consistent. Uh, exercise has always been, I've, I've noticed it's kind of like a uh, an initiator for better habits in a lot of people, both for sleep and for eating as well, where people will tell me, I started working out and now the dominoes are falling and I'm sleeping better, I'm eating better. It's just these habits fall in line when you have consistent exercise. So that's the other advice I would give is make sure that your workouts are intense, make sure they're consistent, and that may very well uh, bring you up to better sleep. Matt, been doing one-legged squats and Bulgarian split squats. Awesome. Trying to build muscle. I was told jumping squats twice a week would be a better bet. Mm, I wouldn't say better, but certainly something to add in for sure. In grind style calisthenics theory, jump squats are a finishing move. So you go with three sets or so of a hard grinding set, like really heavy weighted Bulgarian split squats or single leg squats or whatever. Really, really hard. Smoke those legs out then do jump squats because yes, jumping is very good for the legs. It's like sprinting, it's explosive. And whenever you're moving faster, you're creating more tension in the muscle, but it's a short period of time. It's like, bang, and then it drops. So I, I give this analogy. Think of like working your muscles for muscle growth, kind of like cooking them. Like, oh man, my muscles are so cooked. Literally like as if you're cooking a burger on a grill, right? Now, if you wanna cook a burger on a grill, you don't flip it and lands and then flip it and lands and flip it and lands and flip it and lands. If you keep doing that, even if the, the heat is higher, it's like it's spending more time in the air, it's not going to cook as well. Instead, you want the approach where you're like, put it on the grill and then put a brick on it, like a steak weight, you know, where you just sear the mother living hell out of that sucker and just fry it to a crisp. That's what you want to primarily focus on. Then for the finisher, you do the flipping and stuff to make sure that it's nice and crispy on all ends. So I would recommend three hard, really hard sets. I mean, you should start that first set of squat, jump squats and your legs are like lead. They're like, oh, boy, this is going to hurt. Oh, man. Okay. 20 to 30 repetitions and jump as if your life depended on it. Don't, don't do this like hit style jumping where you're like, we, okay, jump and jump and jump. No, like jump to the moon. Put every little bit of effort you have in that first jump because your goal is you're going to do 20 of them, but you should be exhausted after five. That's your objective with those jumps. Jump like crazy. Everything you've got into those five. And if you can reach 10 and not feel like you're dead on your feet, you're not jumping high enough. So that's what I recommend for programming the jumping for really helping you build some muscle there. All right. Amar, do you believe in taking a week off after months of training? No, I don't believe in mandatory rest, uh, largely because rest and recovery is so subjective and it's so different for every individual. There's nothing bad about it. It's not like saying, okay, I'm going to take a deload week. Will anything bad happen? No. But at the same time, if, especially if you're like making progress and you're really in that groove and you're feeling good about your workouts, stopping is going to kind of disrupt your momentum a little bit. So I am a big fan of take some time off or decrease things down a lot if you feel your performance is starting to go down. Remember, we're basing everything off of performance. If your numbers and your workouts are feeling better and stronger, keep going. There's no need to stop. But if you're feeling pretty run down and burned out and you're like, then yeah, go ahead, take a week off, do some light activity, go out and play some pickup basketball, do some, try a new yoga class or pick up a, a couple of fun activities and stuff, still be active. But uh, yeah, it's fine to take a week off, but uh, it's not mandatory. It's not like it's, it is a little bit more so in the heavier weight arts, 
just because the wear and tear on the joints and stuff can be a little bit more in the nervous system. People feel better about it, but especially with calisthenics and stuff, and especially if you're really improving things as far as neuromuscular proficiency, you're going to have a lot less stress in those joints. So it probably uh, not too bad. Uh, good comment here. Sissy squats are dope. Amen. I just made a video that is going into a new project I'm working on on the sissy squat. Uh, the better I get uh, you, uh, the better I get at sissy squats, the more I love them. I mean, now I seriously like everybody's like your knees, your knees. I get more knee stress walking up a flight of stairs than I do sissy squats because I'm getting better at doing them and stuff. Uh, love the sissy squats. I mean, it's just bees knees if you coin the term. Uh, Felipe, talk about that poster. Yeah, this poster behind me. So I just wanted something like in the background <laughs> other than the, the wall. This I actually picked up on my first trip to, to Japan when I was 17. Uh, that was when I was uh, studying Japanese in high school. And I thought at the time that the court, the path for my life was to go and live in Japan and study Japanese and stuff. My dad who worked at IBM had a trip over there. He's like, well, if you want to go to Japan, come with me on this business trip. And it was literally like three days in Japan, which it took us longer to get there than I was actually there. But I saw this in a, a shop in Kyoto, Japan. They have this neat uh, roof covered open market, which is awesome. And uh, you can buy anything there. And I just saw this. And I don't know what <laughs> this even means. It says down below, it says Doran no Jirai. And for all I know, it says, I like to sleep with sheep for all I know, right? But I just think it looks cool. Of course, it's red and black, very striking and stuff. But this is a, one of my favorite things that I brought back from Japan that time. And every time I've moved, it's like, it's got to have a place of prominence. So who knows? <laughs> who knows uh, wh where it's coming from? All right. Henry, I found that I can only do pistol squats on an elevated surface like an ice chest because my extended leg isn't flexible enough to stick out parallel to the ground. Still good workout? Absolutely. Absolutely. As long as you still have that squatting movement pattern, it's going to work for you. Remember, squat chain, that's all you need is your ass getting closer to your ankles. If it is, great, wonderful. It's, it's going to count and stuff. But I used to do the same thing myself. Uh, it's a couple of things. Lots of times people will say it's a hamstring issue. That's part of it, but it's not the whole picture. It's also a depth issue and your pelvis isn't rotating around enough. So when you squat down, your pelvis actually tucks down underneath you. If you do the old school thinking of squatting where you're just like, sit back in that chair, you're not gonna be able to come down low enough because at some point when you sit back, you have to tuck your hips underneath you. Otherwise, you're just gonna keep leaning forward. When you lean forward, your pelvis is still with an anterior tilt and that's gonna make your leg go downwards and so on. So it's still a fine exercise, but remember that your pelvis is gonna have to tilt a little bit in posture, if you have a little bit of around it in the back, that's perfectly fine. That rule only applies to weighted uh, exercises, specifically if you have weight on your back, bending your spine, perfectly fine, perfectly healthy. And uh, that's what's going on is it's a, oftentimes a range of motion in the depth of your hips. Now, I've been practicing an exercise because I've noticed some imbalances in my own leg from an old injury that's worked great and I highly recommend it. It's very simple. All you do is you stand, I can't really demonstrate it here, but you stand and pick one leg up in front of you, straight and locked. Both legs are straight and locked here. I'll hide that. So both legs are straight and locked, one leg up in front, kind of like if you were playing with uh, like action figures, you know, they move at one joint, treat your hip joint that way. Glutes and hamstrings, tight as can be in your standing leg, and you're working your quads and your hip flexors, because quad is one of your quads as a hip flexor, uh, to lift it up and hold. That's gonna do one of three things going to work on your mobility, your stability, or your strength. One of those is holding you back right now, and it's going to get all three at the same time. Practice that daily. It's kind of a yielding, overcoming isometric hybrid sort of thing, but it does wonders for your leg health and for those single legs uh, squats of yours. So that's what I would recommend. Daily practice on that. Next question, how to avoid injuries for adding too much weight on weighted calisthenics. Well, same way you avoid injuries on non-weighted calisthenics. Injuries are happening because of a misalignment of energy through the body. There's something not going quite right. Usually it's because there's a muscle that's not turning on enough. Oftentimes it's your back, your lats, uh, things are flaring out to the side. This is always why I'm recommending 
keep your technique first and foremost your number one priority, especially with weighted calisthenics. The weight doesn't make you stronger. It doesn't make your muscles bigger and stronger. The weight is there to challenge your technique. It's the technique that makes you bigger and stronger. So get your technique as good as you can during your warm up for non-weighted exercise, let's say dips for example, and then your mission when you're doing dips weighted is to make it look and feel exactly the same, exactly the same. Get a camera out, take a picture of yourself, a video of yourself doing it weighted, not weighted, should look no different at all. Of course, your muscles are gonna be working harder because there's more resistance, obviously, but be very minute about the difference because if there's a difference in how you're applying tension and technique with the weighted calisthenics, that's gonna build up over time to a misalignment and that's where your injuries are going to be happening. Don't forget, when you're adding weight, you're not creating the problem, you're exposing it, and that problem also exists in your non-weighted calisthenics, it's just not as prevalent. So that problem is there, weighted or non-weighted, it's just getting exposed and um, exaggerated with the weight. All right, another good question. What about smaller hands on a thick pull-up bar? I can do one-arm pull-ups on thin bar, but never thick pull-up bars. Guess my hands aren't big enough? Well, I would see that as a bonus because it means it's really working your grip. So your forearms, you're gonna be like Popeye, you're gonna have a crushing grip, it's gonna be fantastic. And yeah, thinner bars are a little bit easier to do that sort of thing with. Um, my hands, I've, I guess, have always been a little bit on the bigger side, because I hate thin bars. I hate like skinny little bars. It's one of my things that I've always kind of not liked so much about conventional dumbbells and barbells, it's just too thin. Uh, if I used a barbell, I would prefer what they call an axle bar. It's basically just a long pipe. It doesn't even have spinning uh, pins at the end. It's just a pipe that's a good two, two and a half inches in diameter. Love those things. I want a big, thick, meaty grip sort of thing. So embrace the meat of the, the bigger bar. It's a good thing. It's very good. You can always use a PVC handle tie uh, like a loop of rope around it and then you can put that over the bar so you can have handles that would be good for you and uh, also just simply the fact of good your grip's going to get stronger and once your grip gets stronger it will cease to be an issue so it will come in time I, I think it's a very good thing it's not so much a problem it's a it's a challenge challenges make you stronger all right more questions let's see here going through Ah, here's a good one. How many times should I work out my calves? Weak calves. Ah, it's like daily. Go for it, man. Uh, as much as you can. I mean, calf training is, is very good to do on a regular basis. Just stand and do calves. A lot of people, when they do calves, they overcomplicate it. They make it too much of a big deal. They get like all this weight on their back and they got to have a calf block and they got to have their feet working in 20 different angles. And No, just, just stand and raise up on the ball of your foot. That's all you got to do. It doesn't even have to be on a ledge. Uh, in fact, part of the job of your lower leg muscles is to stabilize you. So when you're doing them on a flat surface and floor, but you're not hanging on to anything, your calves are going to work really hard for a stability factor. But do make sure that when you're working your calves, you're also engaging all of the other muscles in your leg. Calf training is total leg training, hamstrings, glutes, hips, quads, abs, all of that should be engaged. You should kind of feel like you're been poured in concrete from the waist down. Everything is locked in place. So that way everything is stiff and stable and that's gonna feed the most amount of tension to your calves. Programming, I'd say just go for the burn. Go for the burn and then do 20 reps on top of that. And uh, if you can do more than 100 with two legs, start doing it with one leg. And then, then you might wanna put one hand like on a countertop or something like that just to kind of boost yourself on up. All right. Let's see, more questions. Burpees, push-ups, pull-ups, jump rope, good foundation? Yeah, I mean, sure, the basics will never lie. You'll never falter with the basics, absolutely. But always remember that I don't care what you do. <laughs> I don't care if you're doing push-ups or handstand push-ups or dips or pull-ups versus rows or what that. It's all about getting good at what you do. That's where the results come from. So be a specialist. Take five or six basic exercises and get really, really good at them. I would also include something with an extension to it, some sort of hip extension, bridge sort of action, and something with a squat variation. I know, yeah, the burpees and the jump rope is technically that's got squat, but let's get some real strength going on here. So lunges, 
hill sprints, uh, single leg uh, pistol squats, shrimp squats, Bulgarian split squats, something that's not only going to build the strength, but also the stability and the strength and the mobility in your lower body. Change your life. If you don't have it, you're going to be uh, two strikes uh, when you get to the plate. Uh, <laughs> Philip says, you're bald and beautiful. Thank you. I, uh, I, I was so self-conscious about my hair when I was losing it. Boy, I tell you. But the way I see it, that was Mother Nature's way of saying, you're not really in charge, you know. <laughs> like, you think you're a big fitness personal trainer and, and stuff. is like, no, you're, you're not in charge. Your hair is going bye-bye, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. So I take that as my own personal lesson to say, you know, Mother Nature's in charge. We're just, we're just in her world. Uh, do you practice meditation every time I ride my bike? <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a big believer in just having time to shut down distractions and let your thoughts go. Let your mind just run wild. And I know sometimes in like meditation circles, they talk about monkey mind. And they're like, oh, your mind's all over the place. I think we need more of that these days. I think that was more of a problem back in the day before we had all these distractions. Because right now, We've got far too many distractions where it's like, oh, what's this going on? And what's this next thing I'm scrolling up on? And where's that sign and that ad? And oh, I got this project to do. And oh, hi, Marion. There's a million things and our mind is always getting told what to do and where to think and what to go, right? Having time, whether you're sitting or riding a bike or something where you can just be like, all right, mind, just, just go, just digest everything. Just think it through and stuff. I think that's a very valuable thing to do. Don't try and force the mind to do things uh, while you're doing it. Just let it go. If you want to think about recurring scenes in your head from a movie you watched a week ago, do that, whatever. If you're running through you know, issues with a coworker or something, just do that. Just let your mind digest and run through it. That's for me meditation. It's letting the mind finally digest and run through everything. And oftentimes that's where you're gonna find your greatest breakthroughs, your greatest inspirations is when you finally take everything you've been consuming and you can finally put it together and piece it together. And you're like, oh, now I understand what that was saying and stuff. So I think it's a very, very healthy thing to do for mind and body. It'll probably be good for stress relief as well. Uh, if you could do only five exercises, cardio, what would it be? Ooh, good question, good question, good question. Um, probably pretty close to the uh, variants you'd find in combat conditioning. So push-ups, uh, rows. Yeah, I would take rows over pull-ups, although I would classify them as basically variants of the same thing. Uh, single leg squat variants, so lunges, Bulgarian split squats, that sort of thing. Um, Hanging leg raises, so that way we get our hanging in if we don't have pull-ups, but we're still getting hanging shoulders. Uh, let's see, that's four. Um, and something extending, bridges. That would that would be my bread and butter. And for cardio, you know me, I'd take biking any day. <laughs> any day, although actually I would probably go more with hiking just for the practicality of it all. You just go out for a walk, that's all it is. You just walk up a mountain, all right. What do you think of Ido Portal? I, I can never pronounce this right. Ido, Ido Portal's approach to movement and fitness. I think any kind of movement's a good thing, especially the kind of movements that break you out of that mechanical way of thinking. Because grind style calisthenics, bodybuilding style stuff, that's great, but it's too mechanical. We don't do this all day long. And that's why a lot of times you'll hear of people who have the most mechanical approaches to fitness are the most injury prone because they're always doing this sort of thing and then they got to catch a fly ball like that and they tweak their back or something, right? So I think doing a lot of this crawling and moving around and just being creative in your environment, climb that tree, jump into the water, you know, go and uh, walk across this log. I think we all need more of that and more especially get out in nature, get out into the lakes and the streams and stuff like that. Several weeks ago, I went on a camping trip with uh, the people I work with up to Wyoming and we were paddle boarding and we we're swimming and we were cliff jumping and we were hiking. We we're doing all this sorts of stuff. And by the end of it, we we're all like, man, I feel really good after all of that. And it's like, yeah, because you're doing normal movement in a natural environment. We don't have enough of that. I know Portal definitely has a way to go about it. Uh, Michael, good question. What do you recommend for quickness and punches and kicks? 
I'll give you the same advice Bruce Lee gave, gave people, punch and kick faster. <laughs> that, that was if someone asked Bruce Lee once, they're like, how do I kick faster? It's like, kick faster. Remember, it's a signal coming from your mind. It's the demand from your brain saying, hey, body, you need to step up. You need to do this better. And I know that's kind of a little weird, but that's actually how it works is I need to kick better. So a lot of times, especially as martial artists, we get into a lull of we kick the same way. We punch the same way and stuff. Kick faster. Don't do like a, I'm going to do 100 kicks today and you just kind of whatever, whatever, whatever kind of thing. Like warm up and then literally give yourself five kicks and do them as quick as you possibly can. Fast and powerful, as hard and powerful as you possibly can. Really push those limits. That's going to train you how to be faster right there. Uh, do you still encourage super compensation? Of course. That's how you get bigger. That's how you get stronger. Super compensation, for those who don't know, that's, your, that's the physiological process that causes your body to adapt and change over time. So you expose it to some sort of a stimulus, and oftentimes that causes a stress, although stress isn't the only part that, of that stimulus. It's education, like I was just saying, telling your body to go faster than it normally is, that's what creates a stimulus. You create a stimulus from a neural demand, telling your body to step up, and your body's like, I don't quite have that ability just yet. And that's what stimulates it. So as your body kind of gets hit with something, then as it recovers, like if this is baseline, instead of you know coming back and coming to baseline, your body hits a stress, comes back up, and it's like, oh, wait, he wanted me to go a little harder than last time. He wanted me to be faster. And you go a little tiny bit beyond your initial baseline. And that's super compensation. That's you repeat that over and over and over again. And that's how you go from I can barely do two push ups to doing a lot of push ups or one arm push up, or I can barely lift 10 pounds to I can lift 100 pounds. That's how adaptation happens. So, absolutely, super compensation is what we need. Absolutely. What do I do if I have a curved spine? Well, all spines should be curved. <laughs> should it should have a lumbar curve and your thoracic curve and stuff. But um, I mean, stuff like this, any sort of spinal issues, definitely see a specialist about that. Chiropractor, someone who knows what they're talking about. A lot of times that's a muscular imbalance. Uh, something is tight, usually because it needs to get stronger. Something is uh, not quite engaging. Um, that's uh, definitely a specialist for uh for that sort of area spine is definitely an area you don't want to mess around with too much. All right, last question. Why does convict conditioning want a two minute handstand though? Brutal, it is. But here's the thing, is when you have better alignment with that handstand, two minutes isn't really that hard. So this is a question I often get sometimes. And I know I've been very critical oftentimes when I'm like, why would I wanna do 100 pushups? Why would I do them that easy? And uh, sometimes people are very critical of like the RKC snatch test, like 100 snatches in five minutes. They're like, why would I ever do that? That's kind of stupid. But here's the thing. When you have a deeper understanding of the proficiency of an exercise, you can do it a hell of a lot easier. We're coming back to that idea of do it easier. So handstands, for example, are very much about body alignment. Now, I was part of a challenge years ago, uh, Dan Vinson, the monkey bars, right? They have a special challenge that you can partake in where you have to hold a handstand for a while. And I killed myself to get that minute. It was so freaking hard. I got it eventually, but man, I had to sell my soul for it. And now 90 seconds is a warm up for me. It's hardly anything. And it didn't, it, I didn't get stronger at all. Well, I did get stronger actually, but it wasn't that. It was because I finally opened up my back. I learned I needed to keep my back tighter. I needed to engage my traps more. I needed more engagement in glutes and hamstrings. So when you're doing a handstand and you're like a banana, right? You don't have much of a stacked position against gravity. When you're stacked, you're pretty strong and you can hold that position. But if you're out of alignment, suddenly gravity is pulling you down. It's like when you have poor posture, everything hurts all the time. It's because you're out of alignment and you have a lot more stress and your muscles have to work way harder to hold it. So when you're more stacked and you're more in alignment and you're better at the actual skill of handstands, two minutes is definitely well within people's reach. All right. 
So yeah, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, 49 minutes, boy, that's a lot longer than I was shooting for. I'm trying to keep these things to under half an hour. But again, leave it in the comment section if afternoon is better for you or if this time is still good for you in the evening here. Thank you everybody so much for watching slash listening. And as always, these podcasts are available, the audio on, oh, well, where you get podcasts, you know, <laughs> it's iTunes, Spotify, Amazon, and Audible now have a new service they're coming out with and stuff. Uh, if uh, you want to ask further questions, I always answer them in the comments section, of course, uh, after this streams. And uh, as always, thank you so much for all of your support, picking up my books over reddeltaproject.com. Really greatly appreciate it. I'll talk to you folks next week with more information. As always, I should also mention, I'm always open to suggestions for topics too. So if you want me to cover something in greater detail, leave it down below as well. Peace out, everybody. Talk to you next week. Be fit, live free.